Good afternoon. There we go, that worked. Hello, I'm Judy Singer. I'm the Senior Vice Provost for Faculty Development and Diversity. And uh, I want to welcome you to our fourth year of doing Talking About Teaching. Uh, this series has been going on for, as I said, four years to bring together faculty from across the university to have two kinds of experiences. One, which is, I think, particularly important for anyone who is teaching people, is to have the experience of being a learner, to have the experience of being in a situation where you're not the expert, but rather you're working with someone who is the expert, and you have the experience of what it's like to be a student in a class. And I think that that's the kind of experience that you can't have enough of, and I think having it repeatedly in different kinds of settings just gives us some access to what it's like to get in our students' shoes to do that kind of perspective taking. The other thing that this series provides is an opportunity for us as faculty at Harvard to talk about how we think about teaching and how some of the ideas that we're going to see here this uh, semester might apply, might not apply, might be adapted, might be challenged, and how we can think about innovating in our own teaching and taking risks that we might not uh, otherwise be willing to do. I had lunch today with a faculty member uh, who is a second year person uh, and he is teaching for the first time in uh, some undergraduates and I said, and, and how are you liking it? He said, well, about 100 of the 300 show up and I said, well, what, what are you doing in class? And he says, well, I lecture. And I said, well, have you thought about engaging them in class? And he said, well, but that gives up control. And so we spend all of lunch talking about the fear of giving up control, the ideas about how do we engage our students. And that's part of what this is about, is getting exposed to different ways of thinking about teaching and different ways of, of, of how our colleagues teach to get ourselves out of our comfort zones. So I'm going to turn the podium over to Rob Liu, who is the director of the Bach Center and professor of practice of molecular and cellular biology. But before doing so, I'm going to give you a little homework assignment, which is up there, um, which is take out your smartphones or your tablets or your notebooks and go to the website that's listed there, polyv.com slash uh, uh, and take the first question that's sitting there. And you can do that while Rob's talking. I'm giving you permission to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to, with Judy, kick the series off with Kelly O'Neill. I first actually encountered Kelly in the context of, of a lunch that she was hosting for faculty in the FAS, sharing what she did in one of her courses. And it was truly a transformative session in terms of how do you use imagery to really build narrative, but build a narrative that really speaks to the agency of individual students. And so one of the things that we're really interested in doing sort of with the series of talks that we're having this time, or sessions this time, with talking about teaching, is really focused on how do we support engaged learning in our students through stories? How does the formation of narrative play a critical role in that process? So Kelly, I think, is the perfect person to kick off the series for us. So Kelly, she, she's an associate and professor of history um, here in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. She serves on the executive committee of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies, and is also a member of the Committee on Inner Asian and Altaic Studies. She's also a faculty associate of the Weatherhead Center. She received her PhD here at Harvard and her bachelor's degree at Amherst. Kelly has a remarkable breadth of how she tackles history. She looks at things as varied, for example, as 19th century sort of Black Sea slavery, to what's happening in terms of Russian winemaking and the Russian shipbuilding industry. So she has a remarkably multidisciplinary and multifaceted perspective on the issue of history. So please join me. Oh, and I should also say, and this I think is very important, Kelly is actually on leave. <laughs> this time. And she is here. So I think there should be an extra loud applause for that. But I think without question, she will allow us to really do the arc effectively that we hope happens at these sessions. Namely, to experience as students a particular mode of pedagogy, to debate it afterwards, and hopefully to act on it and incorporate it in terms of how we think about our own teaching. 
And on that front, something that you will experience this year is that we will have follow-up emailings to all of you with informational resources on everything that you hear about that you might be interested in from this session. And there's also a follow-up series of lunches that you will also learn about to continue the discussion as well. So the hope is you experience, you debate, and you act. So please join me in welcoming Kelly O'Neill. Thank you, everyone. I'm sure you all know that I would be a fool to have said no when Rob asked me to, to be here today. I don't yet have tenure, so one doesn't say no to these things. <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's truly a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here uh, presenting at the, the first um, series, the first of the Talking About Teaching series. Um, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart, and I'm very grateful for the invitation to be here. I'm grateful to Colleen Burgess and the staff of the Box Center for all the work that they did to make this happen. And I'm grateful to all of you. I know that time is precious, and you have carved out time in your day, and I'm grateful for that, and I hope that we can make it count. So, um, I'm hoping that at this point you did... Um, go on to the website. I asked you to answer this question just to make sure that everyone is actually able to get in there um, and use this poll everywhere software. I'm just gonna ask you a couple of questions over the course of the session um, that I want your, your real-time response to. So um, I'm hoping that, and this is I, in full disclosure, the first time that I have used this. Um, and so I might be a little bit rusty or a little bit, uh, you know, clumsy, but here, okay. So it looks like we have at least some people up and able to, to access the, um, the site. This is just proof that we are sustaining ourselves and ready for a really engaged session. Um, good, well then we will come back to that in just a moment. Um, today is all about experiencing, doing, building, um, and, and talking, and, and it's not supposed to be about me talking. So I just want to say a couple of things very briefly to kind of foreground the exercise that I'm going to ask you to, um, uh, to participate in. And my plan is simply to share with you a teaching strategy that I have been working on in fits and starts over the last couple of years. And it is essentially my own homegrown kind of response to some of the challenges that I have found teaching the history of the Russian Empire to undergraduates. And really one of the, the main challenges in teaching, wanting to teach a really interesting and rich history course is that most undergraduates don't walk into my classroom speaking an area language. So um, there's a, a wonderful amount of translated material available for the Soviet period there's less material available for the imperial period. And so that has meant that I've had to be a little bit creative about going out and finding really juicy primary sources to bring into the classroom to make history uh, come alive for my students. Um, and so very early on, I turned to visual material as one of the really great sources of, of accessible stuff. Um, and so in my classes, I use paintings and, and postcards and engravings and maps. Um, I even use a set of um, playing cards um, that were produced in 1856 to help students understand the regional and ethnic and economic diversity of the Russian Empire. Um, I quickly found, after doing this for a little while, that to think about visual material uh, as a substitute for textual material. The idea, oh, if only I had really great available textual sources in English, that's what I would do. I'll substitute visual stuff. That to, to think about it that way was to really radically underestimate and misunderstand uh, the value of, of visual sources um, as part of the historical record. Visuals, as I'm sure you all know, are not merely illustrations. They're not just accompaniments. They're, they are evidence in and of themselves. Really fun and wonderful and evocative and provocative evidence, but evidence. Um, visuals make arguments about the past and visuals tell stories, right? I shouldn't even articulate the cliche that you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, but there it is, right? It's, it's waiting to be said. Um, now the narrative power of images draws many of us in. We can't help it. And it certainly draws undergraduates in, students 
react and relate to visual material in really interesting ways. And so I've found that teaching students to unpack the narratives that are embedded in visual sources, that that's a really wonderful skill to cultivate in students, and that it translates that a student who can read an image really well generally tends to be a student who then can take that skill and transfer it to, to other kinds of primary sources, so it's a transferable skill. Um, it's a really nice addition to the scholar, the, maybe just the historian's toolkit, but I think that applies more broadly. And then, just as importantly, um, I think that the um, we owe it to our students, particularly now, to both train them in the art of, of writing, right? There's no more critical skill than being a really good writer, to take that away from as a, as a you know, something almost tangible you can take with you from having a liberal arts education. Um, but we owe it to our students to expose them to the idea that out in the real world, they will be making arguments and, and telling stories through a variety of different media. And being able to, to cultivate some of the skills they need to do that is also, I think, a worthwhile endeavor. So I try to get my students not just to learn how to read an image, but how to build a narrative or make their own argument using images, using visual sources. And spoiler alert, that's what you're going to do today. <laughs> um, and I find, too, that this is something that transfers from working with visual material to working, you know, if you can create, if you can really think um, in visual terms and, and in all kinds of other ways about your, the, the components of one's argument, um, that all translates to writing really good papers, too. So I could go on and on about this, but I won't. We can save that for later. Everything I've prepared for today really boils down to a single point, the one kind of payoff point. And I'll give it to you right now, and then you can tune out for the rest of the time if you want. My goal this afternoon is to push you and to push myself uh, to think about ways to cultivate a more active learning environment. Right? And we've all been steeped in the mantra of I do, we do, you do. Right, the very basic kind of scaffolded learning, gradual release model, um, the tried and true kind of thing. The pedagogic, you know, pedagogically radical thing I want you to do today is to think instead of I do, we do, oh, I keep pressing the wrong arrow, I do, we do, you do. This is the most, probably the most ridiculous slide I've ever made, and yet the one that <laughs> the one that's probably the most important. Translate that into you do, we do. I do, and of course the pronouns are from the perspective of the, the teacher. And the idea here is to get out of the student's way in the initial stages of learning, um, and then and bring them all back together. So to really change the dynamic of the learning experience. So that's really what I'm after, and what I'm going to lead you through is my attempt, my riff on that, my attempt to translate that idea into something one can do in the classroom. So. Um, what I'm going to show you is, is not perfect. You've probably seen more elegant things, and that's great. I'm hoping that's one of the things we can do is really talk about what, what works and what doesn't work about this exercise. I'd like to think that what I'm about to show you is pretty adaptable and pretty scalable. And it certainly doesn't apply only to historians. It, I think this will, there'll be you know, ways to apply this uh, across disciplines. So, that's all I wanted to say. The last thing I need to warn you is not to get too comfortable where you're seated, because this exercise will require you to, to get up and move around the room a little bit, to do things, um, and then you can come back. And so I just ask you to be a little bit flexible, and, um, and we're all in this together, and we will build something just astonishing by the end of the time. So um, the next thing that I want, I think we are done here. So, we are going to now go into kind of role-playing mode. And I am going to be asking you uh, to respond to another poll question. And um, I have not mastered the art of this, so you're going to see my interface for a minute, and I apologize for that. But you know, when I give this presentation next time, um, you know, it will be just beautiful. I'm going to start this, and I'm going to push it, and that should put it on your um, when you go to the website now, you should not see the lunch question. You should see another question. OK, so here we go. Welcome to our unit on Ukraine. Um, over the next few weeks in this imaginary class that we are taking together, we will be examining 
the politics of Ukraine, the history of Ukraine, its economy, we're going to be taking a very interdisciplinary, long durée approach to understanding Ukraine. And the question that might then occur to you is, well, why would one study Ukraine? Why should you invest your time and energy in understanding anything about the, the modern contemporary state uh, of Ukraine, such as it is? Well, maybe to really understand, to really kind of get an answer to the question, why does Ukraine matter? Let's take one step further back from that. And let me ask you, when I say Ukraine, what is your response? What kinds of ideas or words does that generate in your mind? What does Ukraine mean to you, if anything? And remember, you are undergraduates who know a limited amount about the world. Remember, too, that when you answer these questions on these polls, I, they're completely anonymous. I can't tie any of the answers back to you. Um, feel free to channel your inner 18-year-old. That's perfectly fine. Um, you're not expected to be an expert. Um, and I'll explain why in just a minute. But I want you to think, when I say Ukraine, what is your off-the-cuff response? And if you wouldn't mind, I know I, this goes against everything I believe when I'm lecturing. I, Really don't like having laptops and smartphones out, but indulge me here. I pull out your device and, and just log in and plug in a word or two. OK, great. So we have, um, and yeah, keep it coming. That's fine. <laughs> um, complicated, strife, war. War is something that multiple users must have plugged in. This is a, a word cloud. I have no control over how it looks. Um, Folk, gas, crisis, crisis, ethnic, empire, Putin, um, Putin's new imperialism. Someone's getting fancy out there. <laughs> That's great. Revolt, mess, great. OK. So this is how we're thinking right here and now, how we are thinking about Ukraine. Now, so we, we have some ideas about it. What we want to do is, is take those ideas about Ukraine we want to kind of have them in the back of our mind as we now look at some evidence of what Ukraine is like right now um, at this moment. And our task before us is going to be to build um, together in a in collaborative fashion, we are going to build an exhibit. We are going to pretend that the only evidence that could tell us anything about what Ukraine, what is going on in Ukraine right now, what Ukraine is like right now, is a set of images. There's nothing else we could possibly go on. So it doesn't matter if you're not an expert, because the only evidence we can use to talk about Ukraine is the evidence that you have, if you've done your homework, brought with you um, today. And we are going to use these images. We're going to inspect them. We're going to examine them. And we are going to kind of categorize them. And we are going to assemble them on the easels that are spread around this room in a gallery that will, essentially, the Lamont Forum Room is going to become the archive of the only place one could go to understand the contemporary crisis in Ukraine. OK? Now, it's OK if you didn't do your homework. I know that that happens. I have a dog, too. <laughs> and if you did not do your homework, you can get, I'll bail you out. I have about two dozen images um, with a little description of what they are and when they were published. So if you didn't do your homework, you can grab these. And I'm just going to close my eyes and walk around and offer them. And you know what? Grab a, yeah, a couple for each table, sure. OK. So the first part of the task ahead of us is very important. And although we are going to be very friendly to each other for the rest of the time, this is something you do on your own. This is a solitary exercise. It's a moment of reflection. I want you to look at your image. Hopefully, you have a pen or a pencil. If you don't, I'll find one in my bag for you. Um, look at your image and reflect on it. Think about either why you chose it, what was so compelling about this image to you that, that it you know, inspired you to, to download it from the web and print it out in color ink, which costs money. Um, what is it that, you've, that drew you to this image? Think about what it is. And it, it could be something about the content of the image. It could be something structurally about the image itself, about the, the colors, about the, the composition of the image. It could be absolutely anything. Whatever matters most to you. And what I want you to do is once you've kind of, if you could just distill those ideas into a keyword or two, something very concise, flip your image over and write those in legible letters on the back of your image. Now, 
Now, now that you've had a chance to process or reprocess your image, um, we'll take a break from role playing for a minute. If you really were undergraduates and I was really concerned about getting you to talk to people that you didn't know, I might kind of use a random distribution process to put you in different groups. But um, let's, you're comfortably seated for now, so let's stick with our groups. Back into my role. Um, so now, the next phase is to um, turn your images back over so that you can see your images. And you are each in, in the groups, uh, you're, you're seated by, by table here, so we have five working groups. And every group has its own easel. And what I would like you to do is to go to your easel and assemble your images in chronological order. The order in which they, whatever date you put on your image or whatever you know, date appears on the image that I provided for you. Um, assemble a chronology of your images. And there are push pins and those, there are foam boards. And um, it might be a challenge to get you know, six or seven images on the board, but, but you, know, you can be creative. Go ahead and use the, the tacks and stick your images on there in the appropriate chronological order. And you can talk amongst yourselves in order to do this. Do we have our chronology it's more or less worked out. Yeah. I'm hearing lots of good conversation and questioning of, of what you're finding. The idea that the chronology is not as self-evident as it might have appeared. And that's all well and good. I don't want you to get, become too wedded to these chronologies, though. You're going to be forced to, to move on from them. The next step, now that you have kind of wrangled, <laughs> is everyone listening, my dear young undergraduates? Are we paying attention? OK, all right. <laughs> now, everyone, in theory, if we, you know, if we wanted to melt this exercise for all it was worth, we could go around the room and talk about the different chronologies and decisions that went into to compiling these chronologies. That's one way to kind of extend this exercise. And in a history classroom, that might make a lot of sense. I'm going to skip over that little kind of tangent and move on to the next thing. Now, you have assembled these lovely chronologies. You've ordered your images. And I'm guessing that in the process of establishing this chronology, you have been thinking about the content of the images and the, what they're suggesting, the story that they're telling about the crisis in Ukraine. Now, painful as it might be, the next thing that I want you to do is to go back to your easels and take your images down. <laughs> I know, it's OK. Turn them over and put them on the table so that everyone can see the, the keywords, um, the list of keywords that, that you generated when you were doing your individual reflection. And one person can do this. You don't have to all own your individual image. That's perfectly fine. Just someone needs to pull the images off the easel and put them on the table so that you can see um, the keywords that, that you generated. Your task is very simple. I want each group to select or generate two themes two keywords that you think belong in this exhibit. Remember, we are, we are creating an exhibit that will explain what's important, what's significant about the crisis in Ukraine. So I want you to identify uh, two theme, themes among yourselves that you think should be in that exhibit. OK? Now, the trick is you can't pick these themes from out of the blue. You don't have to choose a theme that's written on the piece of paper. You can. You can use those as a really nice foundation. But your themes absolutely have to have some connection to the visual evidence that you have before you, because that's all we know about the crisis in Ukraine. So you have to work from what you have at hand. All right, so each group, I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes, pull your images down, look at the keywords. That's kind of your starting place. Select two of them or agree on two other keywords or themes that describe the crisis, that you belong in this exhibit. All right. And I would like one or two people in the group, once you've decided on these themes, go back to that poll page. And you'll see that it's now asking you um, to, for the themes. And I want one person to, to write in each theme. So we'll have all the themes up on the screen and we can look at them together. OK? Yeah, I know. I'm just going to tell you, Jason, I guess so.
So another minute or so to wrap these up. It doesn't have to be one word. It can be, you know, a short phrase. That's fine. Not too Right. Here are our themes. And you should treat these as a set of nominees, because your work is not yet done. So um, as you will see, around the room we have five easels. We now have 10 potential thematic groupings for, for the images that we have here in this all-important archive. Um, here they are. The new normal, discontent. Symbolism, nationalism, suffering, divided and layered. It's a setup, oppression and suppression, I, we, you, and ethnic identity endures. Now, what I'm going to ask each group to do is very, in very concise fashion, just give us the one or two sentence explanation for why you thought this theme should be on the list. I want everyone to listen very carefully because what comes next is the real fun part, and it is going to, um, it's, it's the payoff moment, and it requires you to have paid close attention and really thought about where your own interests lie. So, if why don't we just start maybe in the back of the room and have um, the group in the corner. Just one of you, if you wouldn't mind volunteering, one or two of you, just give us really the, you know, the, the thumbnail sketch version of why you, why you uh, nominated these two themes. Well, the, the new normal, because we have yeah. a number of pictures of like a market that's bombed out and no one's there anymore, and there's a boat on the side of the road where people are walking, and it's all these things that you see in your everyday life that are just completely different and changed by all of this now. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Great. You want to see the theme? The other theme was I, we, you, because a lot of these images show the individual within a larger context of the strife going on and the oppression going around, on around them and fighting against the oppression. And also one of the most striking images we had was a woman holding a sign, peace for you, capital U period. And so the theme of the individual, I, we, in this struggle together, and you for Ukraine. Uh, one of the images that was um, uh, provided was a map of the Ukra Ukraine um, showing the, the division between Russian speakers as a native language and non, and the um, very sharp borders between the east and west. So we, uh, I think we said set a, sort of like a setup for uh, what happened. And the other one was sort of cycles of suppression, uh, oppression and suppression. Both governments, um, political governments, sort of getting involved and uh, to sort of suppress protests against each other. So there's sort of cycles of suppression and oppression. Great, thank you. Right here. Well, um, we had uh, we had a mixture, including car including political discussion, um, political cartoon, and a person in a shop looking very, presumably a, um, a Moscow shop, looking very unhappy about the prices, and this very striking photograph of a, sol a Russian soldier carrying down the Ukrainian flag. So we talked about how we, our themes were about the powers of the enormous power of symbolism in uh, but time, in pervasive discontent at the political level that ends up being even discontent in everyday life um, and entwined with nationals, national pressure. The <laughs> divide we were working off of that just the, the same as it's a setup, but the the layered point, we had divided, divided and layered were our two words that got up there at the moment. So, 
that. The, the later point was we had several photos that, that showed very militaristic things and then very non-militaristic things going on in exactly in the same photograph. This is three monks and two uh, armed <coughs> people in front of them. We had several photos that had that had that aspect. All right, and then let's do it. Um, okay. We had, uh, our forces were suffering and ethnic identity endures. We had a really um, powerful image of Crimean Tartars commemorating their deportation, and it seemed to us that ethnic identity has played a complicated and important role in what's happened in Ukraine. Um, Russians, Ukrainians, as well as other countries. And our other word was suffering, and we had um, one of our images, a really powerful image, is just sort of um, a body left in the street, which was in fact in the Times yesterday. Um, as well as an image of um, someone just alone in an apartment. So a sense of interior life that was going on while so much was going on. Okay, all right, so we have a really nice range of, of nominees here that are focusing on all kinds of different potential aspects of this crisis at, the, at various scales, the human individual scale, um, at the level of, of geopolitics. Um, there's, there's a lot here. Our task, or your task now, is that knowing you have finite easel resources, mm -hmm. um, that you're going to have to choose five of these themes that are going to be, these are going to be the, the central nodes around which this exhibit um, pivots. We're going to have to call this list. Now, I hope when you're listening to the description of these themes, you know, you have seen not only your own image, you've seen the images, the other images that are at your table. Um, there are lots of images out there that you haven't seen, so I think we're going to need a little bit of feedback from everyone um, to get a sense of what you know, what we really think, what are the, the five themes that we are going to um, mobilize around. So, does anyone want to speak to advocate for a particular theme that they think just has to be in there? It might be one that your group generated and it, you know, you might be inspired by what someone else came up with. What do we need to have in this exhibit? So I vote for the new normal. Mm -hmm. But against this background of suffering, the life continues. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and one of the things that you said the word suffering, right? So one of the things that that kind of suggests is that you know we might be combining a couple of these categories, right, in, in a productive way. So we might choose the new normal and kind of subsume suffering within that, right? That might be one thing we decide we want to do. Yeah, and that helps. We had a picture of the old normal. Uh -huh. uh, so we can, it, it helps bring that, the old normal in compared to the new normal. Okay, so we'd have an element of change over time, which I think was also a recurring theme in some of these among the nominees. Okay. What else needs to be on the, in this exhibit? We have, the new normal is, has been uh, suggested as a candidate, and it will stand unless someone tears it down. <laughs> but we need four more. We have two nominees, and both of them have the capacity to kind of encompass some of the other themes. What else? I'd say nationalism. I feel like that's very kind of strongly conveyed in a lot of these images. Absolutely. Okay. Those of you who are silent will have your opinions trampled upon by those who are not silent. So <laughs> we've got three so far. Two, two so more. It practices content and suffering. Right? It does. It does. In fact, we might be coming towards a meta theme, right, of, of the whole exhibit. Yes. Yeah. I like the setup because of this map and the, mm -hmm. the way that the country was divided before it was divided. Mm -hmm. I think divided in layer touches that. Well, that's true. Put so. mm -hmm. that in there. 
And ethnic identity feels very important to this as well. I vote for that. Okay, new normals, ethnic identity, divided and layered, nationalism. Don't you think some of these things want to be contrasts? The old soul, the new world, the moral, the modern, nationalism, ethnic identity. Each one of these is like a uh, so yeah. some kind of their their intention with each other is that we're trying to encompass something that seems incomprehensible to us sitting here and deep in the heart of the is is these it's this it's all a study in contrasts and then it's the contrasts of <coughs> the ethnic and national the contrast with the old and the new uh, each one of these almost you want to have is that kind of in it. Mm -hmm. Just to, just to build off that point, I think that the thing that we were speaking to in our group is like this tension between the individual, like individuals capability and their abilities to make decisions as opposed to like, we have some pictures of like these small actors, like a man throwing a rock. Mm -hmm. And then we have these large, mobilized, organized movements, like these huge struggles tearing down statues. Um, and so that's, that's, that's something we're we'll thinking with, 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 with you as well. Well then, why don't I issue an executive decree and say that IVU is going to be the, the fifth of our themes. And that way we'll have all kinds of ways to play with productive tensions and issues of scale. And I think that will work really nicely. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm just going to ask for a random volunteer who's sitting close to an easel. Um, who can write, there's a piece of, you'll find two pieces of paper. Um, if one of you who's sitting close to each easel, um, Stephanie, if you wouldn't mind just writing down the new normal. Um, let's see, we, uh, could we have nationalism here? Um, divided and layered? Oh boy, now I've forgotten. Um, I, we, I, we, you, and what was the fifth? <laughs> Ethnic, it's a setup. Ethnic, ethnic identity. Ethnic identity. Ethnic identity. Ethnic identity, sorry, sorry. Eth and ethnic identity. If you could just write, each of you write on one of those pieces of paper in rather large print. And once you've done that, all right, so we have the new normal, nationalism, ethnic identity, um, divided and layered, and I, we, you. So, now, this is the most important part of this whole thing. I want you to reconnect with the image that, that you brought to the table. If you didn't bring an image, choose one of the leftovers that, that's on the table, one that you want to own. And I want you to decide where that image fits best in the exhibit. And I want you to go get up, go to the easel that best fits your image. And if there are stragglers and you want to bring one with you, go ahead and go to the easel where you need to be and talk to the people who are congregating there and assemble the gallery of images that you think best represent um, this narrative. You'll find that there's also a second piece of paper. Yeah, I'll let you go ahead and assemble. Pick your, pick your easel. <laughs> I think that this is what we're supposed to do. I think that's right, yes. Oh, okay. Now stay by stay by the easel where you're attaching your image. I was waiting for you because I, this is the only place my I can go. I'm sure the next step is I think that's perfect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it could be nationalism, it could be I, um, the, the level of the, you know, the anonymous group. Either way. Now, as you, as you are putting your images up, Kelly, no one to talk to me. No, I know. I said this the wrong one. No, no, no. Excellent. Now the last thing that you have to do, this is the final step here. If you have committed your image to an easel, and other people have too, there's a second piece of paper there. And I would like you to just really, we've worked on these images for a while now. I'm gonna give you like two or three minutes. 
And I want you, the last bit is for you to decide, and of course this is something you could extend if you were in your class and you wanted to focus on this, essentially produce a wall text that is going to go with this part of the exhibit. A very short statement of what is going on in this series of images that have now come together. It's probably a very different series of images than you had when you were you know, putting up the chronology. So probably this series tells a different story. So very briefly, what is that story? In a sentence or two, um, just write it down on that second piece of paper, just clearly enough so that one could read it. And then your work for now will be complete. <laughs> Now, one of the things, too, another one of the, the possible, um, you know, tasks that you can assign students with this assignment is not only to, to generate a brief wall text, but also to generate a question, a research question, something that comes out of this close interrogation of these visual sources that they want to explore further. Um, right? We started from the position that they, they're not expected to know anything about this crisis, and the idea here is that going through this process, they now know an awful lot about it. So that is something that I, I try to do, is get students to generate their own research questions. Um, I didn't ask you to do that, because I've put you through enough, and that's, that's fine. But you now have your wall text. Um, we'll leave these up, and of course we can go around and enjoy them. Um, but why don't we just go around and have one representative from each of the, the thematic groupings just um, read the wall text so that we all have a, a nice sense of what it is that we've produced, these five meditations on the meaning of the crisis in Ukraine. Um, how about ethnic identity? Would you mind reading us your wall text? I know you're not seated necessarily. Or, you know, per the person closest. Terry, would you mind just reading no, the wall um, text? If I can read it. Um, <laughs> the crisis evoked old tensions between different ethnic groups living in close quarters in a small region. Um, ethnic identity, I uh, will say, uh, yes, a euphemism screws up the world. <laughs> <laughs> it was a 19-year-old Judy Singer who contributed the original text. Let's make that known. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to. Well, it definitely screws up the world. You're right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Stephanie, would you do the sure. honors? Uh, so ours was the new normal, and we were not nearly so eloquent, where it's very brief. Life continuing amid destruction, living and suffering in the new normal, and then just the word surrealistic. Okay. Okay. Nationalism. Uh, symbols of nationalism are used to manipulate and control the emotion of the people. There was a lot of nuances in there that we wanted to go in to talk about who was controlling who and whether this was um, the people controlling the events or the leaders controlling the people. Mm -hmm. Thanks. This was divided and layered. So deep, long-standing, and multiple divisions make solutions nearly impossible to achieve. Mm -hmm. And how are you? Expresses the struggle of the individual within the community of we to fight against oppression. Peace for you. Thank you. So let me just contrast what you have all generated over the course of the last hour with what you started out with. And I think there is a reasonable amount of overlap, right? You weren't there were kind of intuitions um, that, that nationalism, crisis, strife, um, trouble, mess, complicated, right? All of this was there in kind of the inchoate, off-the-cuff response um, to the idea of Ukraine. And, and now, an hour later, um, let me congratulate you on producing five far more sophisticated and more eloquent kind of expressions of um, of what is significant about the crisis in Ukraine. And the task for us moving forward um, through this unit and over the course of the semester is to continue to unpack 
um, a lot of these, these contradictions, these, these puzzling tensions, uh, the relationships between ethnic identity and religion, um, the relationship of the individual in Ukraine to the state, um, the role that nationalism has played and the idea, of, again, this, the agency of, um, of the individual versus these kind of state level structures and possibly the, the legacies of, of the Soviet past and possibly of the imperial past. Um, the idea of, of space is something that's come out in various ways, whether it's political territorial space or the space um, one inhabits in one's daily life, spaces that are vulnerable to destructive forces and um, you know, sites where emotions come out, emotions that start out maybe as personal trauma and suffering and then get translated into radicalized nationalism and mobilize people to do things they would not have, have done otherwise. There's a lot of really great, fruitful um, work that we can do on what you have generated through this exhibit. So um, congratulations, everyone. That was fabulous. <laughs> well done. You all get an A. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the end of it. The last thing that, um, that is another possible kind of knock-on or you know, extension of this is that um, I like to use this kind of exercise, something that you do in the classroom together as the foundation for an actual project that will then continue to have life. So this isn't something that just goes away. You've worked really hard. Um, so I use a, one of the, the tools that, um, that is now available. There's a, it's, it's called Omeka. It's a, it's a great kind of um, software that allows you to, to take images and curate them and arrange them into exhibits. And so what my students would then do, we did in a class um, last semester, a class I co-taught with a colleague in Slavic, Julia Buckler, um, was to have the, the online curation then reflect the curation that we had done as a group. And, um, and it's, it's a nice way to kind of extend. And then you can go into all thing, kinds of things about capturing metadata and bibliographies and issues of copyright. You could do any kind of extension you want with it, but it's nice to have that kind of reflection um, and the idea that the students, the work that they've done together in the class then has an afterlife um, and something that they can think about over the course of the semester. So that is you know, the extent of what I wanted to, to share with you. Um, I was going to ask you to go back and, and do one last poll and ask you, which I think we'll skip and just turn it over to um, questions and, and you know, conversation. Um, I was just going to ask you, we'll skip the technology side of it, to just to reflect for a moment on what aspect of this process you enjoyed the most, and then what aspect of this process did you learn the most from? Was it the process, the moment where you were given the, the space to reflect on your image as an individual and be alone with your own thoughts, right? Was it the moment where you came together and you were asked to assemble a chronology, right? To, to, there's a very basic logic to it. It was a moment where you started working with someone else, you're in a group context, but there was a relatively achievable goal. It wasn't too messy and too fuzzy, although some of you quickly came to you know, some of the fuzziness of assembling chronologies. Um, was it the process of thinking about all the themes, seeing what everyone else had done, discussing it, and thinking about it? You know, or, or was it the, the last thing we did, placing the image that, you know, your own bit of this, your own piece, into, into the larger work and kind of seeing how it all came together? And it, you don't need to answer that question right now, but I, I think it's something to think about. What part did you enjoy the most and what part did you learn the most from? Are they the same or are they different? And one of the things that I think we can talk about is, you know, there's, of course, everyone knows that there are all kinds of different learning styles and everyone, I, I actually, I was terribly interested. So I took the online quiz that you can take if you haven't done, it's fun to do. It takes all five minutes and it'll tell you what kind of a learner you are. Are you a visual learner, a logical, a verbal, oral, physical, um, solitary, or, or social? And the quiz told me that I am exactly, I'm, I'm everything. <laughs> There's nothing I do better than anything else, which was very disheartening. Um, but, but, um, but you can, you know, read more into that. But the, <laughs> You know, I think the important takeaway is not for us to think about pigeonholing students as particular kinds of learners, but thinking as teachers about the various ways that we can engage them in a variety of different ways to activate different parts of their brain. You know, the more active we are, you know, the, one of the reasons why Rob has been such a huge champion of, of active learning is that 
I am willing to bet that you will remember far more about the crisis in Ukraine having gone through this exercise than you would have if I had stood here for the last hour and lectured on it, um, you know, from my perspective as an ex-regional expert. Um, you will remember more and you will have taken more away from that. So the more ways that we can find to capitalize on the various you know, ways that we all engage with the material that we're studying, um, I think is all to the good and makes the classroom experience more you know, rewarding for everyone, for the teacher and for, and for the student. So those are just some of the things that I thought we could think about, but do I lead, do, do you want me to stand up here and lead things? Do you, I mean, at this point, I, I, mean, I would consider the floor open. I mean, I would love to hear what you think about what worked, what didn't work, what was I thinking. One of the things I will tell you is that every phase, and there is actually a handout which we could circulate, Colleen, if you, um, that just kind of gives you the script, the various steps that I asked you to go through. Um, because every one of those steps does have a particular, and I'll just put these up here, um, has, have a, has a particular reason behind it. And it might be fun for you to kind of guess what those are and, you know, um, and I'm really interested to, to hear your feedback on it, but also to think about how you might be able to adapt, take some piece of this or all of it into your own discipline and what would need to change. And, um, but anyway, and you know, these are the goals that, that I had had. We can kind of come back to those in the discussion if you, if you want to. But thank you all. I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>